Great. Well, I think there's enough people in, so why don't we begin? My name is Andrew Straits. I'm the Associate Director of Research Partnerships at the Ada Lovelace Institute. Tonight, I'll be filling in on moderation duties for Sonia Solomon, who has unfortunately fallen ill, so I'll do my best to make up for her deep expertise on this field. For those who are unfamiliar with the Ada Lovelace Institute, we're an independent research and deliberative body based in London with a mission to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. Our work focuses on a number of program areas that touch the intersection of technology and society, including biometrics, COVID-19 health technologies, ethics and accountability in practice, the future of regulation, and the use of AI and data-driven technologies in the public sector. We're very excited to co-host this event tonight with our event partners, the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at McGill University, a research center dedicated to understanding and addressing the democratic harms of emerging media technologies and to inform and develop fair and accountable governance systems. And the Center for International Governance and Innovation, an independent, nonpartisan think tank based in Waterloo, Canada, with the mission to build bridges from knowledge to power by conducting world leading research and offering innovative policy solutions for the digital era. Our topic for tonight's discussion is national approaches to online harms legislation. From Australia's 2015 e safety bill to the forthcoming bills in the UK, Canada, and Europe, the last few years have seen a surge in legislative activity seeking to make online spaces safer. While the details of these national bills differ, they broadly seek to create new duties of care on online platforms to remove illegal and legal but harmful content, a concept I hope some of our panelists will dive into from their services. To achieve this goal, these bills include a wide variety of policy mechanisms and enforcement measures, including creating a mixture of, not, of binding and non-binding requirements for platforms to disclose the removal practices, disable certain kinds of content within short periods of time, adopt automated moderation systems, disclose user information to law enforcement agencies, and even implement design features that encourage safer user behavior. These bills are also empower existing and new regulators to enforce these practices, providing them with powers to inspect, audit, and assess a platform's behavior and constant moderation policies. But as legislators are learning, it is an enormously difficult task to create online harms legislation. Even defining what safe means is a challenging task involving complex value-laden decisions and enormous risks. While many of these bills are still in draft, they have raised serious concerns to civil society organizations around how various harms are defined and whether they raise conflicts with commitments to free expression. As policymakers around the globe grapple with these challenging questions, it becomes ever more essential to ask, what does good look like when creating these laws? What lessons can we learn from different national contexts about what might and might not work? In this discussion, we brought five experts from different regions to discuss four broad questions. First, what are governments trying to achieve with online safety legislation? How are they defining the problem to solve? And what might success look like? Second, what policy mechanisms can help them to meet these goals? And third, what role do civil society organizations and the public have to play in these legislative packages? Fourth, how can governments ensure international coordination and cooperation on these complex issues? I'm very excited to welcome our five distinguished guests who are joining us today to discuss these issues. First, Prabhat Agarwal is the head, unit, head of units at the European Commission, where he leads the team working on regulation policy for online platforms and e-commerce. His teams are currently tasked with designing the Digital Services Act. Mark Bunting is the Director of Online Safety Policy at Ofcom the UK's communications regulator, having previously served as content policy director. He is responsible for developing Ofcom's regulatory model for online content and conduct regulation, including the regulation of video sharing platforms and its approach to online safety. Daphne Keller is a lecturer at Stanford Law School and the director of program on platform regulation at the Cyber Policy Center. Her work focuses in platform regulation and internet users' rights. She has taught internet law at Stanford, Berkeley and Duke Law Schools. And until 2015, she was actually my boss. She served as the Associate General Counsel for Google, where she had primary responsibility for the company's search products. Lex Gill is a Montreal-based lawyer with a practice focused in public interest litigation, constitutional law, and class actions in the areas of consumer protection and human rights. Since 2017, she has been a fellow of the Citizen Lab, an interdisciplinary laboratory based at the University of Toronto, where her work has focused largely on issues of global freedom of expression, national security policy, equality rights, and automated decision-making technologies. And lastly, Kyle Machado is a lawyer and social scientist. He's a PhD candidate at the Center for Socio-Legal Studies at the University of Oxford, 
and the founder of the Vero Institute, a think tank for imagining ways to build a healthier internet. He is a collaborator at the Center for the Analysis of Liberty and Authoritarianism and the Center for Public Health of the University of Sao Paulo. I want to extend a very deep, great uh, gratitude thanks to all of our guests for joining us tonight. We'll begin with some short provocations from each speaker, followed by a moderated Q&A. And as members of the audience, I encourage you to ask questions using the q and for each speaker's presentation. With that, I'll hand it to our Oh, sorry, I, I'll hang it to you, Prabhat. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, um, and and thank you for having me uh, in this uh, in this very interesting event. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. <clears throat> oh, it's a bit uh, strange still that uh, uh, we cannot see the audience, but I I, uh, I look forward to an interactive uh, um, discussion. And and um, slowly, I'm getting used to having meetings in this format. So I, I am Prabhat uh, Agarwal at the European Commission, and and we're leading the work on the Digital Services Act, which is now in the legislative uh, um, process here in, in the European Commission and I'm happy to to start and kick off with uh, answering some of the questions that um, uh, that 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 you um, put to us and then let me maybe start with what would we trying to achieve with the Digital Services Act and 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 what what are the problems we were trying to solve and and um, and what do we measure how do we measure success how do we know that we get there so I would say broadly speaking there are kind of three categories um, uh, of uh, of problems that we were trying to solve. One is the problem, which is very kind of particular to the European Union, is of uh, of um, setting up a harmonized framework um, of rules across the European Union uh, that will bring together different national initiatives under one umbrella, under one common umbrella. So this is uh, actually typically something where the European legislator. Uh, steps in. Uh, we have um, several different national approaches to um, dealing with illegal content in the European Union and uh, and, and when um, different member states uh, go in similar paths, typically the European legislative steps in. So one of the problems we were trying to solve is what we know sometimes we describe as the fragmentation of the internal market where different different rules apply in different um, member states and we, um, we seek to kind of harmonize those rules with a, a common set. And success here is really measured by 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 the you know by the sense that uh, member states hopefully will have um, that they see uh, you know what they think um, is necessary to protect their citizens um, adequately addressed in a single framework of the Digital Services Act, so that they don't they don't feel the need to pass national legislation in the same area regardless of the legal uh, implications. So this is clearly one thing that was very uh, top of our agenda in the Digital Services Act to have a single set of rules for the European Union. And the second um, er problem we were trying to solve, and this is really something I'm sure we'll get on into more detail, is to, is to increase the level of online safety, most not notably measured by exposure or um, uh, um, the prevalence of illegal content, and we'll have long discussions about how to measure that. Um, while at the same time, maintaining a very high level of, uh, of protection of fundamental rights, which um, as some of the listeners will know in the U European Union, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, which is uh, part of our legal framework. And this charter is, uh, is, uh, is part of the international human rights acquis um, to which the European Union uh, um, belongs. And it's, uh, uh, there's a special human rights courts in Strasbourg uh, that is, uh, um, that's responsible for the enforcement of these rules. And the Charter is also part of the European Union's um, basic legal framework, uh, fundamental rights. So we wanted to um, meet these two uh, um, key objectives to uh, uh, make uh, the online experience safer um, and, and notably in terms of illegal content. Um, and, and then secondly, also to um, write down in law um, some basic protections for fundamental rights for, uh, for, for users. Uh, and, and, and that's a second complex of of uh, and, and there we have a variety of different success metrics. I mean, uh, there are some qualitative ones, there's some quantitative ones, and I, I think we'll have enough times to uh, uh, to go into uh, into some of the details. And the third objective really is really perhaps um, the one that's less visible in the discussions at the moment. The third objective is really to, to have a, a rather comprehensive um, oversight and accountability framework in place. And there, 
I sometimes describe the Digital Services Act as a kind of enormous data generating machine because uh, it has a, a really a very wide ranging set of, uh, um, of uh, data disclosure uh, provisions and, and um, auditing provisions and um, standardization processes uh, uh, available and, and uh, uh, there will be a, a huge number of, uh, of public disclosure elements and some of these um, features will, I think, allow us to really uh, look, um, get a much better understanding. Um, and, uh, and from that understanding, we hope we'll derive uh, a kind of new era of, of, of accountability um, that, uh, that I think is, uh, is rather unique. So we, we, we really designed a, a, um, a, a rather a broad and comprehensive uh, accountability framework, which is really data driven. Uh, a lot of uh, information will be contained in uh, a huge amount of databases and you know we have a proposal a, a very complex database of all statements of reasons for removal um, so we this will allow us to understand in theory how uh, um, content moves around um, you know Ill illegal content moves around how harms uh, because it's not also a single company approach and maybe this is the one thing that I also want to say is that we are very much aware that this is not only about single services or single single providers, but it is also very much about, uh, about um, phenomena that move across and, and have a collective, and there's a, quite a lot of evidence behind that. For example, um, in, in Germany, there was a, a terrible murder of a politician uh, um, from right-wing extremists a couple of, couple of years ago, and it was uh, kind of really prepared um, on, on, on one social media platform, which had a more closed character and then kind of was then uh, also then moved into a kind of open platforms and so those we don't have at the moment any tools accountability tools and cooperation tools for those kind of phenomena which are more collective I would say and not individual and provider driven so those are our three things uh, you know a single set of rules in the European Union uh, um, high level of safety um, particularly in the area of illegal content we make this distinction between illegal content and and other types of content which is very important for uh, our legal framework combined with a very high level of protection of fundamental rights as, as uh, um, in, set out in international human rights law to which uh, we are bound. And then, and then this third objective and problem about having a very comprehensive uh, data-driven um, accountability and transparency framework um, that, uh, that, that is, uh, that, that's, uh, that's there to understand better and to shine a light, uh, a very bright light, I would say, on, uh, on something that has been um, under-researched. Uh, Thank you so much, Pro. That's really interesting points. And I think your points are on metrics and how we measure success is, is one we'll, we'll definitely come back to in the Q&A. Um, with that, I'd love to hand it to Daphne Keller to take us uh, with our next provocation. Uh, yeah, so I unusually have written my notes in a scrawl on a pad of paper, so <laughs> apologies if I'm looking away from the camera. Um, I want to talk about uh, a specter hanging over internet reform, internet law reform. Um, which is there, there's a vision of our regulatory future that's based on the theory or you know more than a theory um, observation um, that harmful content that is spread more widely does more harm you know a, a lie about a politician that is seen by more people is more likely to undermine free and fair elections um, a threat to a journalist on twitter that spreads to more people is more likely to lead to mob action or or doxing um, this is sort of a theory of harm that is known to certainly to the you know us first amendment law i imagine to every legal system that you know certain statements might be um, acceptable and permissible in one context, but become sufficiently dangerous that they're illegal in a different context. Um, but as a framing for internet regulation, this has sort of evolved to an, an instinct or an unstated um, goal of saying that certain speech that is currently legal or generally legal, legal offline, should become illegal when it is distributed on a major platform or when it is promoted in the news feed or you know when it moves into some component of the internet information distribution system um, and that idea that speech that's currently offline a big category of it should become prohibited online or prohibited in parts of online spaces is sort of 
the, the quiet part that needs to be said out loud in a lot of regulatory discussions. Um, because it's not entirely illegitimate for the reasons that I just laid out. At the same time, if, if that is seriously anybody's regulatory goal, it's a significant overhaul of um, fundamental rights, you know, of, of how we regulate human, human behavior and speech. Um, and, and this comes up most conspicuously uh, in, as far as I can see, in the UK online safety bill discussions where I don't track it super closely. So, you know, Mark can correct me if I'm missing uh, the, the nuance, but it seems to me that there's a certain amount of coyness around this question where sometimes it seems um, that advocates for, for the bill do want to promote this expansion where currently lawful but harmful content is sort of systematically restrained more online. And, and sometimes it, it seems that they don't. Um, and being clearer about that, you know, would, would permit us all to have a better policy discussion. If the UK online safety proposal is saying this, is saying a, a class of currently legal speech is now going to be restricted by law on, on the internet or on major platforms, uh, it's taking this unprecedented overhaul of uh, fundamental rights law and dumping it in Mark's lap <laughs> or in Ofcom's lap. And that's, that is, that's a really big burden. It's, it's a really big job. Um, and I, as of the last draft of the online safety bill, there's also, it's dumping sort of the mirror image of that job onto Ofcom also, which is saying, um, not only is there a category of a new category of regulated speech that used to just be legal speech, um, but also at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the, at the good end of the speech spectrum, there's a new category of speech of democratic importance that also gets special privileges uh, in its legal treatment online. And that too is this, you know, interesting, unprecedented, maybe defensible, but, you know, legally complex um, thing to do with the law. Um, and, and it's not something that we can pretend is the same as the kind of questions that media regulators uh, confronted with broadcast law, for example, because the rules you would want to apply to primetime television in 1985 are not the rules that you would want to apply to ordinary people's speech on the internet, so much of which now is mediated via the Facebooks, the Twitters, um, the Reddits, et cetera of the world. Um, nor I think, and, and this is one of my biggest concerns with the UK online, online safety bill, nor can we pretend that there's a good way of creating a system of review for the implementation of these new rules um, that will get us to something like a common law, um, you know, resolving individual disputes and, and clarifying what, what the new rules are supposed to be. Um, Mark's agency does not have the resources for that. No agency has the resources for that. No platform has the resources for that at the scale that internet speech disputes are, are going to arise. Um, and so what seems to be contemplated in, in some versions of these proposals is, is this really big shift in the rules for speech without an accompanying shift in a way of resolving the disputes about them. Um, you know, not because the proposal drafters are, you know, screwing up and forgetting to put that in, but because putting that system for review in is, I think, impossible. Um, so that's hard. <laughs> I, I, will, I will leave that there for, for hopefully future discussion. Um, the DSA, uh, as Prabhat just described, is, is modest by comparison, even though it's not modest at all. It's this incredible overhaul of, of the framework for, um, for regulation of, of platforms and, and uh, their responsibility for user-generated content and, and speech on the internet. I have criticisms of the DSA. In particular, I think the trade-offs it makes between content regulation on the one hand uh, and competition on the other are, are not balanced the way I would want to see them balanced. I think it puts enough burdens on smaller platforms that it disserves the goals of the Digital Markets Act. Um, but that's, you know, that's a relatively marginal criticism. I think so much of it is good. So much of the process it creates for content moderation uh, is what civil society has been asking for for years. 
Um, I also think that the high level regulatory framework for the, the, the biggest platforms of having uh, risk assessments and risk mitigation plans and a regulator who looks at those things is kind of unavoidably the right one because we just don't know what risks will arise in the future and having an expert regulator who's sort of nimble enough to engage and making the platforms go, you know, assess the things they can see coming um, is, is, is a good framework in, in my opinion. And it really does all hinge on having an expert regulator, something that I think the EU and the UK are likely to achieve and the US is unlikely to achieve. Um, so um, thank you, <laughs> you guys. I think we will get the beneficial spillover effects of that. Um, and, and it also depends, um, as, as Prabhat was saying, on creating this data generating machine, on transparency, on uh, better researcher access to data. My, my Stanford colleague, Nate Persily, is testifying to Congress this week about the need for precisely that. He has a draft law proposal for researcher access to platform data here in the US. Um, there are difficult things to navigate for that. There are hard privacy questions. We need a bunch of thoughtful people looking at it and figuring out how transparency can really work without uh, creating a honeypot for surveillance, <laughs> among other things. Um, but, uh, but we can get there and the way that we get there is through Prabhat's data generating machine and, and through expert regulation. Um, so I look forward to discussing the details of that. Thank you so much, Daphne. Lots to chew on there. I think, um, I, I think in particular, that's a really good point around sort of the ways in which we're fundamentally uh, asking for a change in, in, in the ways in which we regulate speech without necessarily a, a plan for how to enforce it. And with that, I mean, Mark, you know, not to put you in the hot spot, but I, I, I will, I, I'll hand to you to uh, give your provocation. Um, uh. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And uh, thanks, Daphne, for uh, setting me up uh, nicely there. Um, I think what I'll do um, is just say a little bit about how the UK legislation uh, is intended to operate. Um, probably worth me being clear for particularly for participants from outside the UK that Ofcom is an independent public body uh, and isn't part of the UK government. So while I can explain the main thrust of the online safety bill uh, and perhaps give a few pointers about how it might be implemented, uh, I can't speak for the government itself or represent its uh, point of view um, and for similar reasons I won't be able to say very much about whether and how uh, the bill ought to be amended, um, although Ofcom has put a few points on the record which I'm, uh, I'm happy to share. Uh, just to be clear on where we are in the process in the UK, uh, there is a draft online safety bill which was published earlier this year. It's currently going through uh, what's known as pre-legislative scrutiny in the UK. Um, where a committee of both Houses of Parliament scrutinise the, uh, the legislation and hear from witnesses and make recommendations. Uh, that committee will report by the 12th of December and the bill will then be reviewed by government and uh, the formal parliamentary process will launch um, early next year. So it's still quite an early point in the, uh, in the legislative journey. Um, I think to pick up um, some of the broad points that Daphne was drawing on there, um, you know, I think we're uh, part of really a global uh, journey in uh, developing approaches to um, oversee and uh, promote the accountability of online platforms as they shape and enforce the boundaries of public speech and the potential harms uh, that arise from that and the potential risks to users' rights. Um, there's a growing consensus that requires some form of legal and uh, policy response. Although I think it's fair to say that the best way to do that is still far from clear. Uh, and these are complex issues with, with trade-offs uh, everywhere uh, and no particularly easy answers. It's very helpful for us, uh, incidentally, to be part of this international debate and um, to hear from the expertise on the panel and in this audience. So uh, I very much welcome being part of the discussion. Um, very briefly, if I can, um, it is a complex framework, but, but I'll try and go through it fairly quickly. Uh, the online safety bill would create a new regulatory framework that applies to all services that host user generated content or facilitate user interaction and search services. Uh, and it creates new duties of care on providers to have appropriate systems and processes to protect their users. Ofcom's primary role is to oversee companies' safety efforts to set clear and proportionate expectations through codes of practice, uh, ensure compliance uh, and thereby improve user safety. 
uh, while also being mindful of the need to protect rights. Um, so I'll just dive into the detail of that in, in four areas uh, quickly to set the scene. Um, firstly, uh, the focus is on companies' systems and processes. Uh, it's not a content regulation regime. It's not particularly a regime that focuses exclusively on companies' content moderation activities. Um, as Daphne said, Ofcom's got no remit to adjudicate individual content decisions under the draft bill, uh, nor to set binding content standards. Uh, instead, it's really a risk management uh, supervisory regime. Uh, the bill requires that companies have processes to identify, mitigate and monitor risks and to be able to demonstrate to us how those processes work. Uh, that doesn't mean complete elimination of risk, um, which I think would be an unachievable goal uh, on the open internet, um, or at least if uh, approaches were implemented that did try to completely eliminate risk, those would be massively impactful for user freedoms. Uh, so this isn't a zero tolerance approach to illegal content um, uh, or to legal but harmful content, uh, but it is a set of expectations about what companies will do to, to manage risk. Um, as Daphne said, there are different expectations for different types of content. Uh, again, this is where it gets a bit complicated, uh, but I'll try to go through it quickly. Um, with respect to, firstly, harm that arises from content that would constitute a criminal offence, uh, the so-called illegal harms, um, all firms in scope have to assess the risk of users encountering that content and take appropriate steps to mitigate the risks, including processes to minimise the presence and dissemination of illegal content. Uh, four harms arising to children from content that may be legal but is inappropriate for younger users. Uh, companies have to assess whether their services are likely to be accessed by under 18s and if they are they must then assess the risks arising from children accessing their services and take steps to prevent children from encountering harmful content. And finally, for the so-called legal but harmful content, and this is the category that uh, Daphne was referring to, this only applies to certain designated high-risk, high-reach services. Um, broadly, I think this is uh, uh, similar to the, uh, the concept of very large online platforms in the DSA. For those services, um, uh, they have to assess the risks of harm arising from legal content, uh, but they can then choose their own appetite for risk as long as their terms and conditions are clear about what types of harmful content they do and don't tolerate, uh, and they apply those terms and conditions consistently. Um, so just to be clear, there's no scope for Ofcom to require companies to address any particular types of uh, legal harm. Um, they just have to do consistently what they say they're going to do uh, in their terms and conditions. A couple of final quick points. Um, the regime isn't prescriptive about what providers must do to manage risks, and it doesn't generally empower Ofcom to be prescriptive either. Each service has to judge the appropriate response to the risks their services pose, uh, while having regard to the importance of free expression and privacy. And Ofcom will provide guidance on the steps they might take, but it's for companies themselves to decide what's appropriate to secure their users' safety. Uh, and finally, um, rather like the DSA, uh, there's a very strong emphasis on transparency and accountability. A number of services will have specific obligations to publish transparency reports. Uh, Ofcom has extensive powers to request information from providers and to make assessments based on that information about the effectiveness of their risk management processes. Uh, and Ofcom itself must also be transparent, conducting a risk assessment of our own uh, once the legislation has passed, which is intended to identify priorities for companies uh, to address uh, and also to produce regular reports on the industry's pro uh, progress uh, based on our review of their, their own uh, transparency. So there is a lot of complexity. Um, as I said, it's not really for me to comment on the government's intent, um, but perhaps for the purposes of this discussion, uh, it's helpful to see what the UK is trying to do as an attempt to reconcile three things which are in tension unavoidably. Uh, firstly, the need for more robust mechanisms for holding companies to account. Secondly, the need for flexibility and agility and therefore a desire not to put very fixed uh, prescriptive requirements in legislation. Uh, and thirdly, of course, legitimate concerns about the impact of regulation on free expression.
uh, we don't think, and the UK government doesn't think, the regulation based solely on enforcement against fixed rules is likely to be effective in this context, given the pace of change and innovation in the sector. Instead, we think the companies themselves and experts in civil society and other public bodies are much better placed to know the risks that services face and the effectiveness of potential responses uh, than any regulator uh, would do. Uh, and what the UK, I think, is trying to achieve is a statutory approach that embeds that oversight and accountability of platforms while also responding to the dynamic nature of online harms and the diversity of services in scope. Uh, I think I'll leave it there. Plenty to uh, discuss in, in Q&A and very happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Mark. That was fantastic. And yes, I mean, there's some very complex issues you've touched on there, um, which I, I imagine we'll come back to you very shortly. Uh, with that, I'll hand to Lick Skull to lead us with the next provocation. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was asked to speak um, sort of from a civil society perspective, but I thought it would be helpful to start by talking about what's going on in my jurisdiction in Canada and why we've been so critical of the Canadian government's proposal so far, because it's a good sort of case study for understanding the role that civil society can play uh, in these conversations. And when I say we here, I'm really talking about organizations and legal scholars, uh, and in particular, my, my colleagues at Citizen Lab, um, you know, because we've been quite involved in this issue so far. So it's important to, to know at the outset that what's been proposed in Canada is not yet a bill. It's, it's a consultation document. It's a bit like a white paper, which outlines the government's intentions. Uh, wh what is proposed is both incredibly complicated and incredibly vague, and in some cases contradictory. So this is going to be necessarily quite high level, but I look forward to questions about the particulars. Um, you know, the starting point is that the proposal purports to cover, and when I say cover, I really mean mandate the, the proactive monitoring, reporting, and removal of five different types of content, which the government refers to as online harms. Uh, those are uh, terrorist propaganda, uh, content inciting violence, uh, hate speech, non-consensual distribution of intimate imagery, and child sexual exploitation content. And, and the government's take in Canada uh, is that all five of these types of content are already illegal, but of course that really flattens the reality of the thing. Um, the proposal in fact enlarges certain elements, uh, it expands others to the discretion of yet uh, uncreated and undefined administrative entities or delegates defers to the platforms themselves. So I think Daphne's comments on that which is sort of lawful but awful are really on point here. Um, and What's more is that from a constitutional law perspective, these five categories really have um, basically nothing in common whatsoever, uh, constitutionally, factually, practically, other than a proposed remedy, which is the remedy of content removal and the, the sort of uh, penal reaction of uh, surveillance reporting to law enforcement and, and Canada spy agency CSIS, among others. And so, uh, you know, the, our constitution in Canada, the charter, as well as Canada's international human rights obligations, uh, you know, the, the problem is that we actually have to analyze um, expression in context, and, and there is a rigorous balancing exercise in place. And so, for example, with non-consensual distribution of intimate imagery, the, the analysis is, is straightforward in some ways, because the expressive value of the content is not likely to be particularly high, given its sort of nature, and determining whether or not an image falls within the category is, at law, a mostly binary question about whether or not the image was distributed with consent. But speech, and I, I know this is, I know that all the people around the table here already understand this, but for the benefit of, of the audience, I think it's just important to spell out that, that speech that appears to approach the statutory definition of, of concepts like terrorist propaganda or incitement to violence or hate propaganda, it's not the same straight line between illegal and legal expression. It's, it's more like a circle in the sense that, um, even content that is very close to what would be truly un unambiguously illegal under Canadian law is still often very likely to have a strong speech rationale, uh, be tied to, to satire or irony or uh, in-group um, discourse, critique. Uh, and so, and, and, and all of that obviously is entitled to constitutional protection and, and international human rights protection. And, and those nuances matter um, because the Canadian government's proposal, um, despite uh, what, what, you know, scholars and academics and lawyers would understand 
our constitution to require basically uh, encourages and endorses mass forms of monitoring and removal of these kinds of uh, this type of content using um, in particular automated and machine learning technology. And, and baked into this proposal are massive fines for non-compliance um, tied specifically to failure to remove quote unquote illegal content, right? So there's no countervailing incentive for the uh, for wrongful removal of lawful content. Uh, the the creation of two new legislature uh, regulators rather is also on the table. Um, the mandates of which are are you know remain ill-defined and unclear. And to you know to Daphne's point about the need for expert decision makers, I think I agree. I think that in, if the government's intention in Canada is really to respond to these particular harms, uh, it's not clear why existing tribunals that we have can't in part uh, meet the remedial challenge. And, and then finally, um, the proposal, well not finally, but includes really quite unsettling mandatory monitoring of users and mandatory reporting requirements to law enforcement agencies and Canada's intelligence agency CSIS. Uh, you know, which obviously has uh, real chilling effect risks from uh, an evidentiary and, and really serious kind of evidentiary problems as well. The, the short thing is that I really have not yet met a single lawyer in this country who is willing to argue that this proposal is constitutional. Um, it, it's a mess. Um, and so I think when we talk about the role of civil society in these kinds of conversations, um, I think that there's something really important to look at about what's going on in Canada. Um, and maybe it's important to start with the a bit of a bit of kind of political context, which is that the liberal government, the governing party in Canada, uh, really enjoys presenting Canada to the international community as a paragon of human rights. And of course, that is uh, in, in in many respects a lie, you know, from our country's uh, genocide and erasure of indigenous people to its continued use of indefinite solitary confinement and immigration detention, and the list goes on. Suffice to say that I really disagree with certain civil society groups who have appealed to Canada's so-called leadership on human rights issues as a way to counter this newest proposal. But, but that said, I think that understanding what Canada is proposing is only coherent if you understand it as Canada's as a sort of continuation of Canada's self-perception as a defender of multiculturalism, of women, of vulnerable groups, of immigrants, and to really see it as a kind of um, legislative white knighting. It, it's a deeply paternalistic approach um, to regulation that's much more extreme than, than just about anything else that's been proposed uh, you know, in the West. So I, I think, um, I think that the government in, in pushing forward um, this pitch has really made a fundamental miscalculation, which is its belief that what vulnerable and marginalized groups want online is one thing, which is safety. Um, and, and that's not true. Um, that's not true. And that is, that is a far cry from what all individuals in this country are, are constitutionally entitled uh, to, to claim. Uh, and I think that there's been a, a shift in the culture, in the political discourse, in the jurisprudence, uh, you know, deeply informed by uh, movements towards intersectionality and critical rights theory and, and a much more expansive view of, of equality rights. And I think that the government has sort of set itself up um, for opposition from kind of like the libertarian right, this idea that um, speech regulation is good, except for when uh, it's opposed by kind of like angry libertarians who have absolutist views of freedom of expression. And the response instead to this consultation, uh, you know, has been anything but. Instead, we've seen um, a real groundswell from civil society organizations across the political spectrums who have said, you know, we, we actually have to do a lot better than this, taking a much more nuanced approach to what uh, you know, first of all, questioning whether or not the government's proposal would would in any way contribute to um, to safety, you know, which is itself a very contested term, which sort of Daphne pointed at a little bit earlier. Um, but also, you know, sort of saying, um, look, uh, we're not just entitled to safety. That's not the only right at stake here. Uh, and, and that any proposal uh, that promotes safety or freedom from online harms at the expense of the right to speak, to create, to relate, to organize is fundamentally insufficient. 
it's unconstitutional, it's paternalistic. And so when I think about the role of civil society in these conversations, I'm really inspired and intrigued by uh, you know, the role that organizations like, for example, uh, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund in Canada has been playing, which is uh, an organization that has kind of opposed this proposal on the basis of its failure to offer a coherent response to the problem of non-consensual distribution of intimate imagery, but at the same time sort of leaned on the realities of the of what we know about, for example, the SESTA-FOSTA debate, uh, the impact on sex workers, on trans people, the chilling effects on uh, kind of different kinds of critical speech. I think the same has been true for anti-racist organizations in Canada who have come out in opposition to this proposal on the basis of the very real fear that it will increase the, the surveillance and the criminalization of racialized groups, which I think is essential, uh, you know, and, and also pointing out that, uh, you know, the, the reality is that to the extent that this proposal furthers the existing powers of Canadian law enforcement, it needs to grapple with the reality that certain communities in our country, as with other countries, are, are, are over-policed, are over-surveilled, are subject to disproportionate consequences. And so I've been really um, fascinated to see this kind of um, really coherent, thoughtful, nuanced opposition from civil society organizations that goes far beyond a sort of what I think the government might have been expecting in, in, in the context of a sort of uh, left-right dichotomy. And I think that what, what we can take from that, and I think I'll, I'll leave my comments here for now, is that uh, it's, on, it's incumbent on us as, as scholars, as advocates, to really be thinking from this, this multifaceted um, perspective uh, and to resist um, a model that is, uh, you know, about a, a particular view of safety um, a particular view of harm and a particular view of rights that does not, you know, really reflect, you know, what we what we know what we know already, which is that they are inherently contradictory, competing, multifaceted. Uh, and so, I think that uh, anyway, I've been really inspired and intrigued and, and interested to see how uh, this has played out so far. And you know, hope the government is going to do something about it. But uh, we have not been. Um, encouraged so far. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. And I'm sure there are, are going to be lots of great questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lex. That was fantastic. Some really good points there about, about how safety is kind of the, the focus of these bills. And that's perhaps not where the, the, the primary interests or concerns lie and, and what other kinds of risks or harms might arise if we prioritize safety overall. Um, I want to hand to Kaya Machado for our last provocation. We'll move to Q&A. If you do have any questions, again, please um, share them in the Q&A section, and I'll do my best to work them in as we move through the moderated section. Uh, but with this, uh, I'll hand to Kyle. Great. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for, for the invite. It's, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, again, uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who, who researches Brazil. Uh, I've been participating a lot in the legal discussions there and more recently participating in civil society. An interesting position where we teamed up with huge influencers and that has shown a lot of power in, in policymaking, which has been positive and I can comment on that separately. Um, so I think, first of all, uh, the legislation in Brazil has a big challenge, which is we're, we're not exactly sure what, what we're trying to do. Uh, to, to illustrate, we, we talk about online harms, a lot of fake news. We had a very polarized elections in 2018. In 2019, we had a, um, an investigation ran by both Congress and Senate on fake news. And the object of the inquiry ranged from attacks on our election, like election interference, attack on our democracy, to cyberbullying, instigating children to commit crimes, suicide, and child pornography. So it's pretty much a big mix, and I'm sure our policymakers are trying are trying to figure out what's going on as well. And I think if we if we try to produce a monolithic solution to address harassment, disinformation, um, <laughs> anyway, threats, and many other practices that we we identify, uh, we won't be able. Uh, I think there are two challenges, and perhaps uh, what I would see as success, at least for Brazil right now. First uh, is improving transparency. This is something that others touched upon, 
I think we need more serious mechanisms for understanding these phenomena. Right now, the data lies within the companies and they use it at, the, uh, at their convenience. Again, in 2018 and early 2019, there was a number of reports in Brazil showing how there was inauthentic behavior going on in WhatsApp. And WhatsApp, the company said, well, we shouldn't do anything because this isn't representative. And they produced a report on, on February 2019 claiming that, well, only you know 0.09% or 0.1% of the, the groups or the WhatsApp communications were used for harm. Uh, and you know they brought this information and my reaction was, okay, first, uh, if there is harm being done, this is a concern. This, the same applies to knives. Uh, maybe only 0.01% of the time someone uses a knife, it is to injure someone, but still stabbing someone is supposed to be criminally punished. The second issue was, well, okay, they're refuting all of our researcher researches, but they're not providing the information, right? They want us to believe their information. So anyway, I, I had a big talk with WhatsApp about this. The, the company has evolved a lot and they're collaborating more today. Not, not enough, I'd say, but definitely more. And that has to be appreciated. And I think to, to a large extent, Facebook and WhatsApp today pay the price for that opacity. The risk of having such drastic measures uh, comes from people not understanding. And now there are uh, bills and sections of the bill proposed, being proposed that really um, jeopardize the business model. So that's something to consider. Transparency, I, I think, is, is a metric for su success. A second issue would be having ways to determine what is public and private communication online. And we have this scalable sociality of the internet that is highly, highly contextual. We have varying levels of, of reach, uh, but legally we, we still have either private or public communication. And, and we kind of have only two possible answers. So I think, I think that breaking down this into smaller pieces could be a way forward, uh, not only in public private communication per se, as in the audience, but also public and private use of communication. I don't think it makes sense in Brazil or, or maybe in any country to have governors using social media as a place for their opinions. So public health policy in Brazil right now is produced partially using public health institutions, uh, but I, I'd, I'd say in the majority through opinions. A president goes to public and says, I think this drug works. Or like he did on Sunday, he said, the vaccines cause AIDS. And that's being communicated to all of the country, right? And that's the public health policy. Do not take vaccine, continue working, do not do social distancing and so on. Um, so I could comment on a bunch of these issues, but I'm gonna jump to international cooperation, which I think is a, is, is a big issue. Um, and I think maybe we're not talking only about international cooperation, uh, but maybe inter-institutional cooperation, because granted, we have a need to cooperate in criminal investigations. Fortunately, Brazil recently and only recently signed the Buddhist Pest Convention. We're late to this party, uh, but I think that's just a small percentage uh, of the problems we face, and most of the let's say dispute resolution and governance is being dealt privately by platforms. Um, and, and I think uh, we have, again, two issues. One is that these uh, private and even constitutional rights are being managed uh, unevenly across the world, around the world. So why can Brazil's president um, read suicide letters, spread falsehoods on the vaccines, uh, call for gatherings, call for the military invasion of the Supreme Court, and, and I could go on, uh, and not be taken down while the American president or former president is taken down. I think these inequalities are issues. So, so we have a problem with what are the rules 
uh, how they are applied and what is the accountability for the application of these rules. And, and I don't think we're anywhere close to, to something that is uh, satis satisfactory. Um, and I think that brings a second issue, which is attached to the first one, which is a legitimacy issue. Um, and I think, and I'll have to agree to, to a very small intent, uh, extent with uh, Bolsonaro at this point, uh, <laughs> just on this point, this small point, which is what is the legitimacy of a US company uh, to take down accounts from public officials in, in, in Brazil or, or, for, or in other, any other country. Uh, I think that's a big issue. I, I don't think that unlimited uh, power to speak, to say whatever they want, like what Bolsonaro wants is a solution. I'm very resistant to that, but I, I think legally we need to put that into a box and say, this is the framework and these are the accountability mechanisms. And this is something I've advocated for in the counter versions of, of the fake news bill in Brazil. Anyway, I, I hope I, I managed to bring some, some new stuff to the, to the discussion. I'd be glad to comment further uh, in the questions. Thank you so much, Kaya. Really excellent provocations. Uh, I really appreciate your points around the question issue around this sort of this double standard. Um, so I'll get to some of the Q&A's from, from the or questions from the audience, but um, just to start us off, I think one trend that I'm picking up um, between these different provocations that I thought would be interesting to, to frame a question back to, the, to this group around is this question of, of what does success look like? What are, what's, a, what's a good success metric? Um, and I was struck by, by Mark's comment about a sort of um, this challenge of looking to companies to set their own standards for um, what kinds of risks they might be facing and how, as, as you've talked about, Kayo, in, in your present, uh, presentation, how um, those standards might not be accountable to all parties. They might be something that uh, they, they have slightly different standards between different audiences. And as we're learning right now, I think someone in the comments mentioned with the Francis Hogan testimony, um, efforts to sort of uh, conduct internal research or to um, set sort of uh, realistic expectations about risk can be swayed by stake shareholder interest. So I wanted to turn the question back to the panelists about what is a way that we can um, measure uh, what it looks like and set sort of metrics of success here that are achievable and accountable uh, that is either relying on um, uh, uh, the um, sort of uh, claims of companies or relying on something else. Um, and I guess I'll start off with Mark with this question, if that's all right, because I'm curious sort of if you might want to pine with that. And then if any other panelists would like to, to chime in, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, it, it's a really good question and uh, I'll be interested in, in others' views. I, I, I picked up uh, Prabhat's uh, observations about metrics for, for measuring safety and, um, you know, that is certainly something that we spend a great deal of time thinking about. Um, I think it is notable that there are not very many uh, widely accepted or widely used metrics for trying to measure harm uh, as it uh, occurs online, um, e even in some of the better understood and more clearly defined uh, types of harm. So I think there are challenges uh, with, with, with measurement of, of safety itself uh, and uh, very much uh, welcome uh, Prabhat's uh, uh, work on that uh, as well. I think though there's a there's another dimension for us, which is, um, you know, if in the end kind of measurements of user safety are both challenging and, and perhaps conceptually um, pretty difficult to really pin down, um, there is another dimension of this, which is really about what are the indicators of more responsible management of uh, a speech environments by platforms. Uh, and can we be looking to drive change in those in a more identifiable uh, way? Uh, and I think actually uh, Francis Haugen's uh, testimony on the one hand reveals that there are still very significant questions uh, to be asked about the extent to which particularly the biggest companies really take into account safety considerations uh, and how those are integrated with their product and engineering uh, decision making. Um, but of course, the other thing that her testimony reveals is that we don't really have very many systematic ways of getting visibility of those processes within companies at the moment. We, we have to rely on whistleblower testimony, which uh, inevitably is uh, limited. 
um, uh, not necessarily comprehensive across uh, industry or consistent across uh, industry. Um, uh, so for us, you know, I think one of the important measures of success is going to be better understanding of the processes by which companies take safety decisions and how what bearing they have on product and engineering and commercial uh, decisions and then greater transparency about those processes. Uh, yes, Daphne, please. I would add that I think it's there's like a unique importance to getting better data about the efficacy of filtering tools or AI tools. And this is one of the, to me, most important things that has come out of the, the coverage of, of the files that Francis released uh, is the article in the Wall Street Journal at the beginning of last week about just how poorly the much vaunted AI hate speech filters perform in real life. Um, and, and because there's so much political consideration about mandating filters. You know, there's a case before the CJEU right now about whether a mandate for copyright filters violates fundamental rights. How can you possibly answer a question like that without data about how well the, the filters perform in real life, their rate of false positives, disparate impact of the patterns of false positives, et cetera. So that, and, and for the UK online service safety, obviously it matters because of the technology notices provision. Um, that would empower Ofcom to potentially require the use of tools like this. You know, before anybody thinks about requiring them, we should have much, much, much better information about what they actually do. Yeah, if, if I could jump. So I, I absolutely agree that the piece around data measurement, transparency, and being really careful about what it is that we're measuring when we talk about um, efficiency and efficacy, I, th I think this is this is really the right starting point. I would also say that, you know, from a sort of principled perspective and, uh, you know, I would want to see a framework that includes remedies for false, false positives for wrongful removal that are as robust as remedies um, for uh, non-removal of content that should have been removed. And so I, and I think without the, the appropriate sort of infrastructure for balancing, for incentives, um, we're going to end, you know, we're, we're almost necessarily going to end up in a situation where the market um, and the regulatory framework dictates speech outcomes. And so I think that that's, um, that's important. I think another piece that I, I want to put on the table is that, um, you know, when we talk about success, I think it's really important to understand that even where we're talking about national legislation, there's a spillover effect uh, in, in the international context. Sometimes there's all kinds of weird jurisdictional issues that, that arise that all of us are, are familiar with in different ways. But, you know, when I think about Canada in particular, it's an extremely diverse, extremely multicultural country, multilinguistic com uh, country. Uh, it, it's a context where there's a, a, a great deal of, of migrants, people who have strong connections to uh, communities in other uh, in other countries, and I think that understanding how these rules will play out in those particular contexts and communities is really essential. And there's, you know, we don't have certainly not from our government, but in general, super great thinking about about that context. And so there has to be a conversation about the sort of um, the equities in the international context that is part of how we think about whether or not this is working. Um, and then I guess that there's sort of like an aesthetic observation that I'd like to make, which, you know, I recently reread um, Seeing Like a State. Um, and I think that there, you know, there's, I think it would be a mistake to think that um, uh, success looks like homogeneity or su success looks like a solution, a set of solutions or principles that are going to apply across all contexts. And I think that, uh, you know, instead, you know, we should be looking for places where friction and diversity and uncertainty are generative and, and interesting. I, I, and I think that when we talk about enforcement, we don't actually want um, you know, we know, even in the criminal law, we don't actually necessarily want, um, you know, that kind of enforcement. So anyway, perhaps a bit of an aesthetic observation more than a sort of legalistic one. But I think that, um, you know, looking for sort of like a, a, you know, we all know that a grand unified theory of content moderation is really not going to get us anywhere fast. So that, those are my thoughts. Thanks. It's a very good point. I mean, I think that homogeneity point is a really key one because what works or, or, or what sort of realities exist for one type of platform with its affordances might be entirely different for another kind of platform. Uh, you might have different demographics and users from one versus another, and that alone is just a source of, of uh, differentiation that's, 
it's challenging to address. Kayo, I, I saw you had your hand raised. Want to come in on this? Okay, cool. I'm just going to quickly add to that. I think uh, one hard or a few metrics of su success. One hard one is sort of shedding the the commercial standards that we use sometimes it, for regulation. So a discussion we had in Brazil was that well to understand what harm is or you know for example from this information that goes around we need to measure the audience because that's the commercial argument right something went viral uh, i don't know how many million views and so on i don't think that makes a lot of sense for understanding harm and measuring harm so our, our measurement of failure is off to some extent and when drafting the law we were faced with some solutions which was well if we find that something is fake news we must oblige the platforms to, to to show the correction like the fact checked version to everyone who saw the false uh, the falsehood so i think we we start in diving into this newsfeed governance type of thing via the judiciary which is extremely uh dangerous if if we don't have the right standard so again my bias uh, what I advocated for is that we need to have some procedural guarantees, uh, both uh, in terms of for the user, how content is removed, specific answers, you know, specific uh, references to the term of use, um, perhaps even a right to explanation, you know. Um, and then at an aggregate level, we need to be able to look at the incentives going on. Uh, are, do we have automated content removal? do you have any way to to identify if the the company has too much of an accent, uh, incentive to over remove content which would be sort of the inverse problem we're having right now um so these are the two I, i'd be looking at or I, that i can suggest so far really interesting points yeah I, I... It, and uh, the automated moder or moderation technologies question is an uh, ongoing one, I think, in terms of uh, uh, the challenges and, and efficacy of the systems as we're seeing. But I think a very good point there. Um, I wanted to move to some of the questions from the audience. And I think there was a few that kind of picked up, uh, Daphne, on your comment around sort of this illegal versus uh, legal but harmful concept and what that might mean about how we construct and construe um, um, uh, platforms as sort of a, a public space, if you will. I, I just want to ch uh, ask if you might want to clarify that point and, and add any more thoughts there on, on what that uh, sort of dynamic. Yeah, well, so my like very big picture thought is um, there is tremendous public demand um for platforms to remove content that is legally protected speech in many countries um but that is offensive and even dangerous and upsetting um you know so in the us some really horrific things like the christchurch massacre video can definitely be lawful to be shared in some contexts uh, commentary news reporting etc um in Spain, I'm told Holocaust denial is protected speech, while in other parts of Europe, it is not. You know, there are just um, a lot of things that have tremendous social approbation that people think there's a moral duty for platforms to take down or an ethical duty, but that under current fundamental rights law or First Amendment law in the US, the government can't force platforms to do it. You can't use a law to get there. You can only use social norms or boycotts or sort of the, the other um, tools of, of um, uh, other tools. Um, and, and that leaves us with this really weird situation where we want platforms to do a thing, the government can't make them do the thing. And so we're acting, asking the platforms to step in and set the rules. Um, and we are asking for a system of rules that by definition are going to be not accountable to democratic processes, not accountable in the US to constitutional constraints, although in other human rights systems there, there might be more human rights based accountability. And that's just, you know, that's a problematic shift to have significant demand for something the government can't regulate and control, but private companies can. Very good point. Lex, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I think I just, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I also think that it's really important and um, to, to understand that it's, it's just not true that there is legal and 
uh, illegal speech um, and that there is actually a, when we talk even about what could be illegal content there's a huge spectrum there and so we can go from the end of you know speech where or expression that is that is literally the evidence of or the actus reus of a criminal offense like child pornography right to speech uh, that that constitutes proof of a criminal offense like like in Canada hate speech but elsewhere not a crime right um you know, to, which is a very narrowly defined category in Canadian law, by the way. I mean, it's, it's a very, very strictly, in any case, you know, and then we, we kind of move into sort of like a regulatory context where, for example, um, expression that is in violation of intellectual property rights, violation of copyright, you know, that's illegal speech uh, to content that might give rise to a private civil remedy, but is not inherently illegal. So, like, for example, like defamatory speech, right? And there's a full spectrum. And when we talk about these various proposals, you know, a lot of content that that is considered sort of like um, like harmful in these conversations is often at best falling into this like could give rise to a private law remedy or could be evidence of another criminal offense, but no, is not determinative. Like there's really a spectrum here. And so I think that this idea that there's a sort of binary categorization even within a single jurisdiction. Uh, is false. And, uh, and so if we're not kind of engaging with that reality, we're, we're losing ground. Um. Yeah, very good point. And I think this touches on something that uh, one of the uh, uh, participants read about sort of the potential for harm as perhaps like a way to look for this. But even that is very difficult when you talk about online speech in some cases. I, I think that that also raises really challenging issues if I had to look at this. I, I, uh, Kayo, I see your hands raised. Would you like to come in on this as well? Yeah, just a, a quick point to illustrate what what Lex was saying, because I think it's a great point. Um, in Brazil, we had this assumption that disinformation was the message going around and that was either legal or illegal. And that resulted in perhaps what is the most turbulent, conflictuous point in the whole fake news bill, which was a traceability mechanism for WhatsApp. So not breaking cryptography, but somehow at the end of the line, you'd be able to trace back a message to everyone who was sending it around. And if you have an illegal message, well, great, you're going to find the source, you're going to find who's the big person behind the, the scheme, which is a problematic assumption per se, because you, you can print screen content jumps from one platform to, to another, but also because it assumes that the illegality of the act is in this unit of communication that is going around. And so I could have an image and I'm reporting it to an authority who's passing it on, who is disinforming. So we, if we lose all of these con contextual elements of the conversation only to have the message at the end, we end up running the risk of inverting the burden of proof, inverting uh, the presumption of innocence and being completely ineffective at the end. So. Again, I think Lex's point was, was great, and, and we're living this drama in, in Brazil right now, and this might pass. It's really good points. I think this touches on another related question that's come up around international coordination. So you know, I think if, if we're talking in some respects about creating national codes of practice for individual platforms to operate, these are not national platforms. There are uh, multinational um, uh, corporations that have, um, in some cases, and, and these mega platforms, uh, offices everywhere. And, and I guess this raises the question of how, what kinds of coordination or cooperation are possible in uh, developing these national approaches? And Prabhat, I was curious, you know, it, when, when you're speaking sort of about, uh, in, your, in your provocation, you talked about sort of harmonization across the EU as, as a, a goal. I was curious if, if you could speak at all about how um, you're seeing that uh, process work in terms of harmonizing between different member states. And if you are, as the European Commission is engaging with other national um, attempts to uh, regulate and, and um, enforce online harms codes of practices on, on platforms. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. And I'm sorry, I had some kind of very strange technical problems, so uh, I, I lost a bit of the connection. Uh, no, I mean, just uh, two questions for this. I think uh, one is, um, um, actually, it's the nature of the European legislature to, you know, to have a supremacy of EU law over national rules, and, and, um, and that's, uh, um, that's how we, uh, we harmonize. So the D Digital Services Act is proposed in technical terms as something known as a regulation, which is immediately binding, as opposed to a directive, which is a, 
which needs to be transposed by member states in, in national law. So regulation has kind of what we call direct effect on all member states. And it has also blocking, blocking effect over national rules. So uh, because of the primacy of EU law over, over national law. So in areas that are also covered by the Digital Services Act, um, the Digital Services Act takes precedence over national rules and they should either be amended or repealed in, in those areas where there's, a, um, where, where there's a conflict. So that's within the European Union, the, the kind of legal order um, associated. Of course, this only works in area where we have competence uh, and in this area, which is uh, related uh, to, um, to the uh, in, in functioning of the internal market for digital services. So so that's uh, clearly an area where we have competence. So this is also an area where we can harmonize as it is known in the technical jargon. So I apologize for this very technical. I'm not actually even a lawyer, so it's, it's, uh, but I, uh, with all this work, I'm starting to sound like one maybe, but, but maybe the experts like, like, like Lex and, and Daphne will tell that I'm just faking it. But uh, um, it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's just the way that it is uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the European Union. Now, one thing I, I think is very important for us because the, the legal nature of the Digital Services Act being directly applicable across the whole European Union. Um, and and uh, in the European Union, we have quite a lot of, um, you know, different approaches also to uh, things like defamation or freedom of expression or, or definitions of, 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 of hate speech as well. And, and we also have quite a lot of concerns about you know, fundamental rights, uh, notably in the context of LGBTQ uh, um, communities who are being, you know, quite seriously attacked at the moment in, in certain parts of the European Union. So we, we are also keen um, that our rules need to be ultra precise. Um, so we actually took uh, extra care and, and this is very much of the, we are in the legislative markup and I actually just spent eight hours in the legislative markup with the council today on, on some of the provisions and, and we are, very keen uh, that um, that that the that the provisions are really razor sharp um, and uh, leave no uh, margin for misunderstanding or, or confusion, and that's also why some of the rules are formulated as as procedural requirements and not as substantive requirements, because in some areas it's very hard to formulate. So we we in the European Union we kind of uh, um, did not want to you know use broad terms such as duties of care and so on, which, are, which leave an open margin. Those function well in, 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 in countries with have strong constitutional controls. Um, but here with a direct, um, uh, you know, uh, and they, they kind of control in such constitutional controls and then, then control any excess power that is transferred to a regulator in the, in the margin of, of maneuver. And we don't want to be in that situation. We, we want to actually have everything as, 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 as uh, you know, little margin of interpretation as possible. It's not, it's, this is a hard challenge. I'm not saying we got it right or certainly uh, in every, every time, but this is uh, our ambition and, and, and it's really the scrutiny, the part of the legislative scrutiny that we are in. Um, this is one of the, um, this is one of the, um, the key elements that we are being discussed and also something where uh, our, our, our legal services are holding us to a very high standard uh, um, and, and, uh, and, and generally speaking, this is, and, and I just, I, I couldn't unfortunately catch everything that Lex was saying in earlier interventions, but the bits that I captured um, really ring true to us as well, is that we want to actually, the, our nightmare scenario is that we formulate rules that are so broad and therefore so open to interpretation that they actually have the opposite effect um, in, uh, of, uh, of what we were trying to uh, uh, achieve, you know, and that this is something that, that we've also learned about um, very broadly, overbroad formulated uh, um, uh, uh, rules also at national level. I think in the chat, somebody mentioned, you know, um, there have been constitutional concerns in France perhaps of, of, of rules uh, because of their overbroad impacts. And they, those were actually rules that were pretty precisely formulated, you know, but, uh, um, but, but the, 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 this is a fine line and, and to get it right is a really a, a, a tricky challenge. And, and so uh, there's a narrow path here and we try to walk that narrow path, but the component of the narrow path is to be absolutely um, precise. I think that I just wanted to say, uh, um, say that as well. And this is sometimes also something that in terms of international corporations is that we often look at, at, at rules from other jurisdictions who are regulating and who sometimes come to us and say, we know you're doing great work on the, this and that, and, and what do you think of our rules? And, 
and we are always um, struck by by how um, how the initial attempt is always. And I and I can fully understand the drafters, you know, because they're getting a mission impossible, you know, from some politician to say, please draft a bill on online arms, you know, and it's really hard to do. Um, and the first thing they they say is do they have to do something without saying what they have to do. Right, because it's really hard to say what they have to do exactly, and and um, and often we want them to do one thing and the exact opposite the next day as well. You know, so um, it's a tough challenge, and and this is but this is something that this is the kind of narrow uh, path we try to walk in the DSA. Yeah, that's no, a, re a really good point, uh, Mark. I saw you had your hammers as well about this sort of international coordination piece. Did you want to come? Yeah, th thanks, Andrew. I was going to comment on the uh, international coordination, but um, I, I might pick up the points about um, uh, about precision in uh, in law uh, as well. And in, interested in others' views uh, on the international coordination. I mean, obviously, this is a really crucial issue for us, uh, particularly since we no longer have the benefit of being able to work quite so closely with Prabhat and his colleagues uh, uh, through the EU uh, institutions and. Um, uh, you know, uh, for, for our own uh, domestic uh, political reasons, um, which isn't to say that we don't uh, seek to work closely with the Commission. And I know our teams have ha have a lot of contacts, but in the end, there'll be separate uh, legal frameworks in a way that they weren't before. Um, I think it's important to say that that collaboration, uh, because there's such global interest in this area has to extend beyond uh, Europe and um, uh, you know we also have close relationships with our counterparts in uh, territories like uh, like Canada and uh, Australia and, and New Zealand but also countries that like uh, India and um, Singapore who are working uh, increasingly in these areas as well it's not to say we're going to take the same approach uh, as all those jurisdictions, but understanding the way that different jurisdictions are bearing on what companies have to do is obviously a really important part of our, our calculations. Um, the other thing, just briefly, not to take us down too much of a, um, uh, a rabbit warren, but um, in the EU, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive uh, has also been a really important instrument for us, which we have transposed into UK law. Uh, and have published uh, guidance for video sharing platforms who are now in scope of that regulation. And again, that's an area where we work very closely and spend a lot of time talking to our counterparts uh, in other European uh, countries. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd very much um, uh, appreciate uh, uh, engagement uh, with the European Commission on that as well. So I think despite the fact that the UK is now in a slightly more uh, uh, tracking it, plowing its own furrow than we might have been um, a few years ago. Uh, that, that aspect of international coordination continues to be uh, very important for us. Um, on the points uh, about precision in law, I mean, um, you know, I very much uh, hear the points that uh, Prabhat has made, and I think it will be one of the areas where there's continued room for debate during the UK parliamentary process. Um, I think, as I said in my remarks, there is a trade-off to be struck here between sufficient clarity in law that companies themselves are clear about what they have to do, which of course is important, uh, coupled with flexibility for ind individual companies to choose a proportionate response for them. Uh, and those concerns about proportionality and about impacts on competition uh, are very much uh, uppermost uh, in, in our minds. I think the other thing that's uh, uppermost uh, in our minds is how we implement a regulatory regime which is capable of adapting to continual changes in services and in harms uh, and in the uh, technical solutions that are available to address risks of harm. Uh, and so that balance between precision, certainty, clarity for companies and for consumers uh, with flexibility to ensure that regulation is as future-proof as it can be, I, I think is, is one of the really um, important uh, aspects of this debate. And, you know, it's not for me to say whether the UK has got that exactly right right now, but uh, it's, it's certainly an area that's going to be continued uh, discussion, I'm sure. Very good points. I think that point around precision and clarity for industry is, is extremely important. Um, any ambiguity, I imagine, just yeah raises the risk of, of, of more challenges coming down the line. Um, we have about eight minutes left before we need to wrap up. Um, and I suppose I wanted to end with a question about this, this sort of notion of the expert regulator, which I think Daphne had touched on very briefly and a couple others have picked up in their comments. Um, 
there is, I think, a, a big question here about what would a regulator like Ofcom uh, or, or others um, uh, that are on the national level need in order to, to um, effectually um, uh, um, act on these kinds of, of bills? What powers, what types of expertise, what kinds of capacity, what kinds of resources would they need? And I was wondering if any others had any comments on sort of what they would look for in terms of an expert regulator who would be responsible for taking up these kinds of challenges. Hands on Lex, yes, please. Okay. Um, I mean, this this might not be the the exact direction that you're hoping for. I mean, so so first, I would just want to flag that there are like an infinite number of fascinating and complicated questions about judicial review of these kinds of entities, which are far beyond the scope of this conversation. But for the administrative law nerds out there, a shout out to the judicial review problem. Um, I do okay, when we talk about like what these expert regulators can or should look like. Um, I want to put a different kind of expert regulator that you know all of our jurisdictions have on the table, uh, or and in Canada, you know we like competition tribunals, uh, human rights tribunals, the privacy commissioner, uh, or, or whatever sort of uh, the national permutations of those entities might be. Um, I think that the response that we've seen in Canada has been, uh, we need not just one, but in fact, two new agencies to be created to um, deal with bad stuff on the internet, as though those bad things are distinct from all the other things that the government might be regulating, which I think is a bizarre approach. And it's one that sort of omits uh, to recognize that we actually do have um, expert agencies in government who have at least to some degree subject matter expertise and jurisdiction over these kinds of questions already. I think that the other piece is that we have institutions to varying degrees um, underempowered, underfunded, or sidelined to deal with the other set of incentives and problems related to these large tech platforms, which is the business model. And um, there is a, an interesting and important line of thinking that I think is increasingly emerging over recent years in the conversations around antitrust, that it is in fact the business model of uh, many of these large tech platforms that contributes, exasper exacerbates, complicates the, the substantive content issues, including issues like uh, misinformation, disinformation, harmful content, extremist content, and so on. And so I think that um, part of the conversation around expert regulators is also just about thinking about what, what is the full constellation of issues and how might intervening to better protect people's privacy reign in the ways that um, individuals' data is, is monetized and deputized against them. Um, you know, how might intervening in those areas um, might might actually respond better to some of the concerns that we're raising in the content moderation conversation. Anyway, thanks. It's a very good point. And I think it touches on a, on a related question of what can design um, offer as a, as a way to ameliorate some of these issues. Um, I, I think business models is one thing. Uh, one of the other concerns I think has been raised by similar uh, um, uh, critics has been around that the ability to just instantly virally share information at the pace and scale creates an incomprehensible problem and an unsolvable problem for content moderators at these firms. That firms of these size are just too large to moderate. Um, and I think that raises, I think, a challenge that some of these bills are trying to get at with their sort of safety by design approach. You know, the Australian safety uh, bill talks about this, and I believe the online safety in, uh, bill in the UK also includes provisions like this. I'm curious if any of the panelists have thoughts about if that is a viable um, pathway towards uh, mitigating some of these issues that perhaps isn't based in regulation. Uh, I think um, Daphne has written about amplification also carrying a lot of speech problems, right? So it's not so easy to just turn off the tap and, uh, and, and to say all the problems go away, you know? So I think, um, I'm not sure whether Daphne already posted uh, her, her, her excellent paper on this uh, in, in, in the chat, but I think that's a, that contains a, a very thoughtful um, you know, rundown of all the problems. Having said that, I think um, what, what, what we, um, you know, I think that um, non-regulatory approaches uh, are, are typically in the European Union either kind of voluntary or codes of conduct based uh, approaches, you know, so um, well, one thing that in the Digital Services Act we try to do is to kind of build them in into the overall framework, you know, so uh, 
although they remain voluntary, you know, but um, non-compliance is a kind of aggravating factor with the kind of sanction regime. You know, if you kind of deliberately kind of you walk away from a code of conduct, you know, you 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 can be all, you know, they kind of encouraged very strongly as part of risk mitigation me measures. And one of the risks we are identifying is is, is kind of um, you know viral speed. And I think co colleagues who are probably listening here on the call, or maybe even some of the panelists, you know, have been talk talking about circuit breakers and those kind of those things are discussed by Daphne in her paper. And they're not trivial in themselves either. Having said that, I think that 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 um, that this is an area where, and then then there also let's not forget that there is viral content that we want to be viral. You know, if there's kind of um, uh, you know, I think we're all happy about getting the news fast when some something happens that we all want to know about immediately. You know, and thank God some of this stuff goes viral, right? I mean, uh, um, so uh, this is also the other side of uh, of that is that you know one of the questions, one of the tough questions we try to answer in the DSA is that you know there's no content moderation rule that only works for bad content and not simultaneously also does something on good content, you know, and there's, and I don't think such a rule exists, you know, so what we tried to do in the, in the design of the DSA is we had stress testing scenarios available and saying what, what other scenario do we have and in, in, in alternative scenario and how would such a rule actually be stress tested in all directions. And then the result often is not, and this is maybe a surprising experience, is not often a kind of don't do anything or lowest common denominator, you know. But again, it is a kind of, it often comes back to procedural rules or transparency rules that, uh, that end up being the right, right approach because it's very hard to write a bright line rule that, does, that only works for bad content and, and that doesn't have a, a, something for, for, for good content. And I think that Daphne in her paper has brought this out very nicely, but, but this is certainly some, some approach that we have. We have some, some, I wouldn't say bright line, maybe kind of mud, muddy line rules in the DSA uh, and, and we have some, a, a set of soft measures um, around code of conduct to address this problem, but it's a, it's a hard problem. Daphne, I've, 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 if you want to come in, we've got about a minute and a half to, to, for your comment and for Kyle, it's okay if we go a little bit over, but um, yeah, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be super fast. So um, Prabhat, thank you for your kind words about the paper. It, it goes into a fair amount of detail about how regulating amplification of content would run into some real First Amendment problems in the US. Um, but that is for reason, it wouldn't run into such severe problems, perhaps in other human rights systems, but the values trade-off issues there and the goals and the fundamental rights questions are the, are the same in any legal system. So um, I, I would encourage people to, to take a look at it if that's something they're interested in. But you know, where I wind up with that paper um, is thinking rather than having a top-down dictate from the government saying, here's the speech you should amplify, here's the speech you shouldn't, here's the margin of error, we're gonna, you know, the sort of top-down speech-related rules. Um, some of these problems we can alternately address with sort of bottom-up rules grounded in privacy or competition or data protection that work by empowering users more and, and creating more diversity of uh, you know, speech ecosystems uh, on, on the internet than we have today. So I do think there are approaches that sidestep debates about speech and focus on privacy and competition that can be very productive. I uh, will give you the last word, Kyle, please. Thank you. Um, so just a quick take on that. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried again from, from the angle I'm looking uh, from uh, is that we shouldn't go into let's say feature level when when dealing with legislation so thinking of uh, platform features themselves which are not static and sometimes we have this tendency to look at them as something static such as private messaging is private but then it can go viral uh, close friends is something private but then it's used to sell pornography so there's uh, features are extremely dynamic platforms introduce them all the time their use evolves uh, through time and uh, it seems to be that to me that all the attempts trying to look at aspects of the service either amplification either certain features themselves either let's say user interference have limited effects so i think in the law we put the where we were heading at uh, the North, you know, the prog programmatic rules such as privacy, competition, and so on. And at an infralegal level, I think regulation is necessary because we need a stamp saying, well, 
you know, forwarding to 20 groups is a good idea or it is not a good idea. Um, leaving it to the platforms so far hasn't been successful. Maybe they'll, they'll start, uh, you know, being more proactive. But so far, I think looking at interface and, and other aspects, one thing kind of pulls into the other. If you're regulating data, you'll end up regulating algorithms at the same time and the way you exercise your privacy, which is interface. So I, I think having the big guidelines and then uh, expert regulators is probably the best way, at least so far. Thank you so much. Uh, that is an excellent note to end our discussion on. I wanna thank all of our panelists again so much for joining us tonight and for bearing with my country, UK Wi-Fi. Uh, it's been such a pleasure just to speak with you all. And thank you so much for our participants, our, our attendees for, for joining us tonight. Um, once again, this recording will be made available on our website in about 24 hours along um, a little bit later than that with a sort of uh, textual write-up description. Um, and we will be hosting, I think, another event on uh, the same topic later in Q1, still to be determined, but please watch this space. Again, thank you so much to all of our speakers today and have a lovely rest of the night. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Andrew.